with that, um, I'll hand it over to Jason to kind of kick us off with uh, the NoSQL talk. I guess everyone's there, so yeah. Uh, and we tried the same, sharing the same deck here. How's everybody tonight? Good. Oh, oh, oh. No one's falling asleep for things in the food. That's nice. So when Matt approached me about coming to speak in Chicago, um, investing full stack with no sequel development, it was a very interesting topic. Obviously, very hot. There's a lot of people here tonight. So uh, for those of you who don't know what it is, it involves uh, um, the new way of doing um, databases with no sequel. <laughs> Um, which replaces RDMS. So, but before we get into that, I want to talk a little about something here. This is the Chicago.net developers group, right? Three years ago today, I met my loving my loving girlfriend here um, at this very group with our first ever <laughs> date, as it were. Um, she's been a lot of you've met her. She's been here all many many times, and you know, we've been having, we've had some amazing memories <laughs> together, and uh, I want to ask her to come up here for a second. Woo! <laughs> 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 show. You are, you are the love of my life. You're my best friend, and these last three years have been an absolute joy with you and every moment we've shared together. Tonight, I want to stop being your boyfriend and ask you a question. Adam, Jordan, head you then. Stand up, please. Oh, my God, You lied to me. <laughs> you said you were working. <laughs> oh, my God. That's been in the, in the first oh. for two months. <laughs> so I hope you, uh, let's go see how to see you first. Thank you guys. Congrats. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Well, that's a tough act to follow. Yeah, really. um, you know, my wife has never been to a single one of my. Uh, so that's, that's really incredible. That's true. It's true. So I'm going to try to stall for time here. Let you guys uh, calm down a little bit. Let myself calm down a little bit. Because I was doing this too. Uh, he came to me, uh, well, I came to him and said, I want to speak to the user group. And he said, well, I've got this idea. Can you send me your slide deck? And I'll add some uh, stuff to it. So I'm, I'm very excited to be here. This is an amazing surprise, and I'm glad I could be a part of it. But uh, let me tell you about myself here. Um, I'm, uh, I'm Matt Groves. That's my Twitter account up there. I have a podcast and a blog. If any of you guys are interested in being on my podcast as a guest, I would love to have you on, crosscuttingconcerns.com. I have some uh, really cool acronyms here. Oh, they're on their way out. So I have one more hand for the happy couple. I have some cool acronyms here. There's one more I didn't have time to add, uh, because as of Sunday, I am the Groves Family 2016 Corn Bowl Champion. So I can, you guys should all know that as well about me. Uh, but, but more importantly, uh, when it comes to sessions like this, can you guys hear me in the back okay? Do I need to speak louder or anything? You can hear okay? Great, great. Um, I'm not an expert on, on 
no sequel or anything like that. I'm just an enthusiast. I'm, I'm excited to learn about it and tell you guys about it. And uh, you know, if you guys can pick up one little thing or just try out a NoSQL database, that's, that's the reason I'm sort of up here. So uh, I do work for Couchbase. I'm a developer advocate for Couchbase. So let me just head off the inevitable question because it always comes up. Uh, Couchbase and CouchDB, they share an acronym of Couch. Otherwise, they're not the same thing. I mean, they're both NoSQL databases, but CouchDB is Apache Foundation, CouchBase is CouchBase Incorporated, and uh, they're not a fork of each other or anything like that. They're two different NoSQL databases. So I just want to get that out of the way, since I know it was probably going to be asked anyway. And um, if you guys uh, feel like tweeting, use the hashtag CouchBase. Um, I would appreciate that so my boss doesn't think I'm here screwing around. Uh, I, I would say I got stickers for you in return, but I left them on my desk right before I uh, left for the airport uh, on uh, on Monday. Oh, so we're out Tuesday, of here then. So sorry about that. What? <laughs> we're out of here then. Oh, <laughs> I was screwed up. But if you really, really want stickers, I just let me know and I'll, I'll get them mailed to you. All right, so we're going to talk about full stack development with .NET and NoSQL. And if you're like me, right off the bat, you may have some problems with some of these buzzwords in the title. So let me just address those because it's out of the way too. So when I say full stack, a lot of people are like, well, you don't really mean full stack. You're not writing the operating system. You know, you're not writing device drivers and so on. And, and you're right. It's not the, the full full stack. It's the application part of the stack. And, you know, the, the, the software and maybe some infrastructure code. So that's what I mean by full stack. And the other term is NoSQL, which I have a problem with. And I work for a NoSQL company. And the problem is that it describes what it doesn't do, which isn't terribly useful. Uh, but it's, it's a good shorthand for you know databases that are different than what we've been doing for the last 20 or 30 years. So kind of a helpful little marketing shorthand. If I didn't use these shorthand terms, the title of the talk would be something more like this. It isn't quite as zippy. It doesn't really roll off the tongue. And probably wouldn't fit in the uh, text box or the uh, submission form. So. Um, if you have those concerns about buzzwords, I'm with you too. Um, but we're talking about full stack development. And what that means is basically you're somewhere around this middle part here. You know, you're working on the, the UI, the front end. Uh, you're working with the database. You're developing some business logic in the back end. And you might be even deploying to infrastructure, coding out containers and continuous deployment, things like that. So anybody? familiar with being in this spot in your organization, sort of being a jack of all trades, everything, all the different heads. Okay, good, good. So that's what we're really talking about. And and we say when we say stacks. These are some of the acronyms you might see when it comes to describing a stack. So the LAMP stack. Anybody familiar with that acronym? Uh, the mean stack is kind of the newer uh, stack that we're talking about today. The actual individual elements aren't as important. Um, you know, Linux. It could be Windows, it could be a WAMP stack, but it's still the concept is there. It's more server heavy. And then over here with the mean stack, it could be, in this case, Angular, but it could be uh, you know, um, React or some other UI framework. The actual individual tools aren't important. So when we we're talking about the stack, we mean the whole application layer there, the individual components that make it up. Now in the mean stack, though, the, the M up here typically stands for Mongo, but that's the NoSQL part of it. And so why is NoSQL sort of part of these, these, newer, uh, these newer stacks that we're seeing, like, like the mean stack? And one of the reasons is when you're developing these types of applications, you're often just developing endpoints for your UI to consume. Angular is going to make calls to the endpoints and then render the UI, handle all the UI interactions there in the browser. So what you often see is you start with relational tables, and you create an endpoint that renders something like this. It's a JSON document, you know, a REST endpoint that returns JSON. And so what people started to think was, well, why don't I store this instead of storing all these different tables? And then I can cut out all the joins and all the, you know, relational uh, crap that goes along with that. So that's why NoSQL is very appealing to these types of apps. Um, but I, I will say that Jason made the comment that it's the replacement for relational. And that's, I don't know if that's really fair because there are some places where relational is totally fine. You know, it's a, it's a good fit for applications. You are, you're comfortable with the tooling, you're comfortable with the, the way to use it. So if your application fits into that model, totally fine. I'm not suggesting you, you ditch it tomorrow or, or you never use it again. 
there are places where you can use relational still effectively. And sometimes you can use NoSQL alongside a relational as well. You know, it's what NoSQL is good at and then what relational is good at working together in one app. Here are some uh, guidelines, some rules of thumb for why you might use one or the other. I mean, these are hard and fast rules and no silver bullet either way, right? So it's just a different approach, different way of thinking. I'm going to talk a lot about uh, Couchbase tonight. And uh, Couchbase is a distributed uh, NoSQL database, which means that it's deployed to multiple machines. And the reason you, you do that is to um, improve performance, scalability, and uh, availability. So that you, know, you don't have to take down the whole database, do some maintenance work, and then and put it back up. You can take them down a, a piece by piece and do maintenance. Or if one node fails, well, the rest of the database will pick up the slack and keep working. A lot of people come to Couchbase because of the managed cache that's built right into Couchbase. So they'll use it for as sort of the front end for their relational data, build it into a cache, and that way you can make requests to it very, very quickly from, from in memory. So a lot of people start using Couchbase for that. And it can also act as a, a dumb key value store. You can store whatever value you want in the, in the value. I'm going to talk about tonight its use as a document database, which is there's a lot of cool functionality there for document databases. And so by document, I mean a JSON object stored as the value in a, in a key value sort of situation. If we have time today, I'm also going to show you some of the mobile stuff that Couchbase has as an embedded database, as well as some synchronization stuff that I can show you as well. With Couchbase, we like to say that it provides two things, agility and scalability. And with, the, with agility is that slide I showed you earlier where you don't have to have all the schema stuff and all the joins and things like that. Um, so it's, it's easier sometimes to get started and, and to develop that. You don't have to worry about being some mismatch and ORMs and things like that. Um, some really cool querying stuff I'm going to show you a little bit of tonight. I'm also going to be showing it more in depth tomorrow with the Lake County User Group, if any of you guys are up that way. And uh, some big data stuff and, and mobile. With scaling, I said we have elastic scalability, so you can just rack up additional servers to improve your scalability or, or drop them down. So maybe after Black Friday is over or after uh, you know, the freshmen have all completed their forms, you can, okay, let's dial back down the servers, we'll save some money. We don't need all that capacity right now. So it's on because of that distributed nature. So if a single node goes down, that means the rest of it will pick up the slack and it'll keep going. We have some cool stuff with multi-data center. If you have different geographical locations, you can sync the data between those pretty easily. Some really good administration stuff built right into Couchbase server. I'm going to show you some of that tonight. Any kind of enterprise security you would, you would expect. Now I'm going to talk mostly about .NET and C Sharp today. But Couchbase can work with a lot of different languages and frameworks, as can many NoSQL databases. Um, Java, Node, uh, all works fine. Uh, you can use, I'm going to use Web API tonight, if anyone's familiar with that. You can use MVC, you can use Nancy, whatever else framework you want. Uh, I'm going to show it on Windows. You can, of course, use it on Linux and Mac OS X as well. And you can also deploy it to various containers like, uh, like Docker and also to, to uh, cloud services like Amazon and Azure, um, OpenStack, etc. Anybody here into a big data? type stuff, big data tools, analysis, reporting, things like that. Couchbase has a lot of integrations with some of the more popular ones like uh, Hadoop, and Spark, and Kafka. Just all sort of uh, native, well, not native, but uh, plugins that work directly with Couchbase for that integration. So I'm not going to talk about that much tonight here, but if you're interested in that kind of stuff, Couchbase can help you there. So the Couchbase server, the way it works, is that you have a number of nodes, you need at least one, which is what I'm going to show you tonight, but for production you probably need uh, three or more nodes to really get the full benefit. But each node is equally important as any other node. So there's not like a master slave or primary secondary type of thing going on. They're, they're all individually as important as each other. And they each provide uh, storage, caching, and this cluster manager, which is what as developers we'll be interacting with mostly. You can also add on data service, query service, and uh, indexing service to each node or to multiple nodes. So for instance, if you wanted to, if you have a very query heavy application, 
you could uh, put the query service on nodes that have faster processors or more RAM. Um, if you're just storing data and not really querying it very much, you can just uh, you know, rack up servers without that query service and so on. So there's a lot of options there for horizontal scaling as well as vertical scaling, what we call multidimensional scaling. Here's a screenshot of the Couchbase admin UI. This is built in when you install Couchbase server. You access this via browser. We'll see some more of that today. But you get a, a nice dashboard here of all the, the status of the nodes and operations per second and how much RAM is being used up and so on. Additionally, we have some REST integration. So you can interact with the cluster and do lots of operations with REST if you want to automate um, various operations with administration. So that's sort of the, the basic intro there. Now, when you're accessing data from a NoSQL database like Couchbase, there's a couple, a few different ways you can, you can get to that data. And one of the most common ways is to just access data by a key. So this means, so your data in Couchbase is stored as a key value, and the value is a JSON document. And you say, okay, I want a document that has key, K2. And Couchbase says, okay, here's your document. Here's your document. And that is a very, very quick operation, because oftentimes you're going to be interacting with Couchbase's uh, managed cache layer. So it's going to be a direct RAM access. You're not going to have to do the disk. You get a lot of these uh, in many cases. And then the reads and writes are distributed evenly amongst those nodes I talked about. So if you have four or five nodes, when you write documents, it's going to be distributed evenly through an auto-sharding mechanism that is done with hashing. So you don't have to configure that. It's just going to spread out the data uh, as you start writing to it. If you want to do something more complex, like some sort of query, one option you can do is a view using a static query. And these are often in the form of MapReduce. So anybody familiar with the uh, MapReduce pair of functions there? You basically write a mapping function that says, you know, I want some properties of the document. So if I have three person documents, I can say, give me the name and the age of each of those persons. And then a reduce function, which says, well, I only want to get the, uh, the names that have an age greater than 21. So I'll reduce them to just even one. And with Couchbase, you can write these and deploy them. Uh, two Couchbase clusters, and you write them with JavaScript. So you write a, a map and reduce function together, and you can call them and, and run, those, run those queries. So these are uh, what's used for the dashboard, by the way, that, that I showed you earlier. We have some MapReduce queries built in that Couchbase uses to get those statistics and, and metrics. And they're incrementally updated. So this, this can help you power analytics and reporting and things like that. These are really strong for complex custom aggregations. One other thing that uh, you can do with Couchbase that I really like, one of the things I like most about Couchbase, in fact, is that even though it's a NoSQL database, you can execute a SQL query against it. Uh, actually, it's called NICL, N1QL, which is a superset of, of SQL. So if you know SQL, then you already can use NICL with the Couchbase database. So in this case, I've said select star from bucket where age is greater than 21, which is kind of what I showed you in the MapReduce. Couchbase will figure that out and return receiving a list. So you can use your SQL skills with a NoSQL database. That's why I think the term is just kind of outliving its usefulness, because, yeah, it's, it's NoSQL, but it has SQL. Whatever. There's also ODBC drivers available, so if you want to integrate with BI tools like Power BI or Excel, things like that, you can, you can plug in ODBC drivers for that. All right, well, so let's get to some .NET now. Couchbase has an official supported .NET SDK. So you find it on NuGet called Couchbase Net Client. Currently, it's compatible only with the full .NET framework. We are very, very close, very close to releasing a .NET Core version of the SDK. So that's on its way. Um, not quite public yet, but it's, it's almost there. Uh, it's open source, by the way. Everything is open source here. So you can watch the progress of the .NET Core as it's being developed, uh, as I'm doing. All right, so if I wanted to start building an application, once I've included Couchbase Net Client from NuGet, once I've installed Couchbase Server somewhere, probably in your local machine, 
me start by introducing some namespaces here. So I'm going to use uh, the nickel. So I'm, that's why I'm including the Couchbase nickel namespace. You guys see this code okay back there? I know we got another TV back there too. Probably would help it. Um, but here are some, some snippets showing how you can start, you know, bootstrapping your application to top of Couchbase. You can start by defining a client configuration object and telling that object where all the nodes are. And so I'm just just one node in my example, so I'm saying, oh, it's a Couchbase uh, colon slash slash localhost. If I had other nodes, I'd list them there. Optionally, I need at least one node. And then I'd say, okay, initialize my cluster helper using that configuration. So once I've initialized the cluster helper, I can then use that to talk to my Couchbase cluster. And that's going to use the, the, the cluster manager that I showed you in the previous diagram, sort of behind the scenes. So once I have a cluster helper, I say, well, give me uh, access, give me, you know, a bucket object. So I'll give you a bucket name, optionally a password, and now I have access to a bucket. Now a, a Couchbase bucket is uh, what we call a, a collection of documents. And each document in that bucket has to have a unique key. So no two documents can have the same key. So it's kind of like a namespace in that way. Uh, typically, you have one bucket per application. That's a rule of thumb. It's not required, but that's generally the guideline. So it's it's kind of like a database, but kind of not. And it's not like a table or anything like that. The next thing I want to show in this slide here is that I can just pass in a nickel string here to the query request and create that query object. And I'm not showing in this example, but I could also pass in parameters to that and some other options to execute a query and get results back. I'll show more of that later. Then the last step that I want to show you is how to create and save a document. So I'm just creating uh, a new document object here of type dynamic. You don't have to use dynamic, but I did because I'm super lazy. I don't want to create a type for just this sample. Um, so it could be document of person or document of invoice. That, that's really up to you. And the ID is going to be the key of that document. There's no rules about what that can be. It could be a string, a GUID, a, a number, some more complex value. That's, that's up to you guys to decide what you want your key to be. It does have to be unique within that bucket. And then the content is where I'm going to put the object that's going to get serialized into JSON and stored in um, my NoSQL database, Couchbase. And I just did an anonymous object here, but it could be just a, a POCO, whatever you want to put in there. Um, that's that's up to you. It'll serialize it to JSON and store it in the database. What by saying bucket not insert saves it into Couchbase. Okay. So any questions on that so far? All right. At any time you guys have questions, feel free to stop me, wave your hand around, get my attention. You don't have to wait till the end if you think of something. Yeah, go ahead. So uh, prior to the slide, you were talking about uh, how the different. Um, Instances or different nodes are like put across. Do you have to have uh, odd number of nodes then? You have to have an odd number of nodes? Yeah. Uh, uh, why would that be? Uh, for consistency, checking to see who ends out in case two nodes get differing. Uh, okay. So your question is then if, if two nodes get split or one node goes right. down? Split brain, right? Right. So it's like split brain network. So the, the way Couchbase works, I don't want to necessarily get into this too much today, but uh, you must be familiar with the CAC theorem, I assume. Uh, you have to choose between consistency and availability. Couchbase has made the choice to choose consistency. So that means if a node goes down with the document on it, and you try to write a new value to that document, it will refuse that write. And say you can't save that because the node's down. Um, so that way there are no conflicts with Couchbase. Um, now you can still possibly access a copy of that document as a replica. You can get a read-only view of that document. And if that node needs to fail over, which can be done automatically, by the way, then that dot, that replica will be promoted to an active document that you could then start reading around to. So it's made that it's made that decision to go the other way. There's no conflicts, things like that, with with Calvary. You might have one follow-up. Sure, go ahead. The um, I I'm more of a SQL guy, right? But, sure. Uh, we all do. Right, yeah, like the whole room, right? Yeah. But uh, with, with Mongo, I know that there's uh, in configuration you can choose how you want to close transactions. You know, whether whether it's written to one node or written to more than one node or all yeah. nodes. Mm -hmm. Do you have the same kind of configuration? Yeah. So, so the question is basically, uh, if I want to 
a saving document and guarantee that it's saved to multiple nodes, or re replicated is what we call it. So you can absolutely do that with Couchbase. So one of the things I mentioned earlier is that when you write to Couchbase, it writes to the memory. And when you do that, Couchbase says, okay, I'm done. Go on about your business. Now there's a chance that you know, your node could go down before that document gets saved to disk, right? There's a small chance, right? Or, you know, millisecond or whatever. So you can also say, I, I'm not going to consider this a success until you've saved it to disk, and then return me a success message. It's going to take a little longer, right? Because you're guaranteed to write it to disk. Similarly, there's options to replicate it as well. So you can say, I'm not going to consider this a success until you've replicated the document onto one, two, or three other nodes. So you can definitely configure that. It's just going to take longer for your transaction or for your document to be saved. Thank you. Yeah. Very good question. Okay. All right, here's a little bit more. I'm going to show some async, a await stuff tonight. Anybody comfortable with async and await and C sharp and .NET? Seeing no hands. You know, so I'm not raising my hand either because I'm not comfortable with it. <laughs> so if I get it wrong, please come and, and tell me afterwards. But I've done my best to uh, figure out the async a await stuff. It's not required. You don't have to do async a await. There's both synchronous and asynchronous options with test case. I'm going to go through this line by line here. So this is just a method that's going to run a query. It's going to return a task that has some result in it. And the parameter I'm expecting is a nickel query of some sort. Then I'm going to say query request.create and pass that string in. It'll return a query that I'm going to run. And then I'm going to use the query async method. Again, keeping it dynamic because I'm lazy. That could just as easily be a POCO object in there. That's going to map the results to. This will return a um, result object. And I'm awaiting it through the asynchronous version. The results object has things like, was it successful? Uh, what was the error if it wasn't successful? It also has a rows, which it's not really rows, but it contains all the documents that it found in the query mapped to whatever type you specified. So in my case, dynamic is going to map them to dynamic object. If you did person, it would map them to person object. Just maps them up by, by name. Right? And so that results rows is going to be a list of dynamic in this case, and that's what's going to be returned by this asynchronous method, a list of dynamic objects. Okay. Let's see a little more of that later as well. What I want to show you now is a demo. So this code is all available online. If I can get on the screen here. Oops. The wrong Windows key. Right, you can see that okay back there. Code isn't terribly important right now. I just want to show you a quick demo. So I've got a Couchbase server running locally on my Windows machine here. And so I'm going to run my uh, app here. This is an Angular app. It's uh, oh I left some I was messing with this earlier, so I left some stuff in here. Sorry. It's an Angular app, Angular 1, Angular JS. Zoom in a little bit here. It's a very simple CRUD application. It's going to give me a list of persons. I can add a new person with a new item button. And once persons show up, I can start editing them and deleting them. So we'll say, uh, I'm going to last pass. Say the groom. The groom at the groom com. So that saves a new uh, person object there. And I can say, Bride, the bride, bride dot edu. Okay, so now I've got two person documents in there. I can edit them and delete them. So I made a mistake. This should be dot com. Save that. And so I made the change there. I can go ahead and I don't want to delete either of them. I feel bad if I do that. So let's get myself in here. So I show up. As Matthew Groves, and I can hit delete. There is no confirmation that says, are you sure you want to delete? Because, again, I'm super lazy. Um, but we can now go over to the Couchbase console, which is by default port 8091. I'll just log into that console here. This is kind of like your uh, SQL Server Management Studio. That's how I, I think of it in my mind. It's, it's that sort of utility that I use to interact with the database. So I can see that I've got uh, some RAM allocated for my data nodes, some, some disk allocated, 
I've got two buckets, some operations per second are happening. I've got one server. You click on server nodes here and see that I've got one node and it's up and it's got all three services running. And uh, I've got 31,000 plus documents in it right now. Go over to data buckets. You see I've got two buckets. Uh, travel sample we'll talk about later, but default's the one I'm using for my full stack application. There's two items in there, right? The bride and the groom. Click on documents. There they are, bride and the groom. And I'm choosing some GUID for the for the key for those documents. So there's the key in the left column. The content is a JSON object. And I can even drill down, edit those if I wanted to. You can see the full document here in JSON. There we go. We also got this type field in here, which we'll talk about some later. There's nothing magical about any of these fields. It could be completely arbitrary JSON. I can have arrays in here. Um, nested objects, nested, nested, nested objects, etc. As complex as JSON as I want to make. Okay, what else do I want to show here? I think that's it. So, any questions on my extremely amazing CRUD app with, uh, with using Angular and Web API and the whole thing? Okay, we're going to dig into some code of this application, but it is available on GitHub so you don't have to. Uh, you, know, you can get it later and play with the whole thing. I'm not going to show you every little bit of code in the app so you can get the whole thing later and check that out. Let's head back over to the slides. Where are they? Let's go back to the start floor. Okay. Where was I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, demo web. All right, so um, we, well, when I say we, I mean uh, Couchbase likes to talk about the Keen stack because we're putting ourselves in there instead of Mongo, uh, making the Keen stack or the Kane stack, maybe, I don't know. Um, but there's not a really cool acronym for us Microsoft guys. We have Web API instead of Express, and we have ASP.NET or IIS instead of Node. So, I don't know, it's like uh, Kawa or, or Waka, it doesn't really, really well work. But the individual pieces aren't terribly important in a full stack app, right? You have some sort of uh, endpoint framework, you have a, a UI framework running in the browser, and you have the server that's running your your website, your endpoints, your operating system on there too, and so on. Um, Qua? Qua? No, it's not working. But th this is the this is sort of that modern stack design that uh, Jason mentioned early on and what the Keen stack basically is, is that we have everything in the front end there. We have templates, we have JavaScript, CSS, all over there. This side we just have endpoints. So there's no razor over here, there's no HTML, there's nothing like that being rendered. It's just endpoints returning JSON data running on a server back end. And so they're, they're nicely separated. They're only joined together by those endpoints and by those URLs. And so what that means is you could hypothetically switch this out to some other framework or some other UI and back end with the main text or vice versa. Or more to the point, you could reuse that back end across multiple applications. So I have a web app I'm showing you, but I could consume that endpoint from my phone or from some other device, like uh, I guess an Xbox controller, I don't know. Um, but let's say I purchased uh, a product via the browser, uh, it would show up as um, you know, on my phone, so I'm using the same endpoint. I can see that order history <coughs> on my phone there. So they're all front ends to a single back end. So let's talk about the back end here. So you know, Web API. Anybody here familiar with Web API or used it before? A few people? Yeah, okay. I like Web API. Um, MVC works fine too, or some other framework that you like, but I'm going to go with Web API. Let's start with the most exciting part, the web.config file. I've added a couple config settings here with the point to the server. I really need that port number on there, but fine. Um, so this is just localhost, which that basically is the same. And I've called it bucket restful sample, although mine's called default. So you can call it bucket, whatever you want to call it. So those are just two settings in a, in a web config file or an app config file or whatever. An application start. So this first part you guys should be familiar with if you've done a file new before. That's all you know, generated for you by Visual Studio, <coughs> doing routing and, and so on. This new part down here is kind of what we've seen before, setting up our cluster, 
helper is passing in uh, app config setting now from that uh, web, or web config setting <coughs> to the URI. I'm turning off SSL because I'm running this locally, so I don't have a certificate initializing cluster helper. So kind of what we've seen before. And then finally, I'll put a cluster helper close to make sure any resources um, when the application you know restarts or whatever gets closed back. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Got any uh, cluster ID, like random sort of load balance IP? Or again, so basically, you can hit any node in the cluster, or is it like aware of like all the nodes in the cluster? Okay. Sure. So the question is, uh, what, what am I pointing to with this cluster IP here, right here? And with Couchbase, the answer is you could point to one or all the nodes in the cluster. There is no load balancing um, node or load balancing node. They're all equal. I understand what I'll read there, but I mean, yeah. if you point to a specific node, that node goes down. Yeah, well, okay, so if that node goes down, so once you connect, the cluster helper is going to go to that node, it's going to figure out what all the other nodes are. No, but if that node is already down. Yes, yes, so, but, but it's a very good point, I'm coming to this, is that if your application restarts and that node goes down, then it's not going to be able to connect, because you're only giving it one node. So it's a, it's a good practice to give it all the nodes that you know about here in the config. So that's why this is a, a list of URIs. So my example is just one locally running node. But in the real production app, you probably specify all the nodes that you know of here. So it's a good idea to do that. OK, well, let's get to a endpoint here. So I'm creating a RESTful controller. It's an Web API controller. It's help is inheriting from API controller up there. And I'm going to say, all right, new up this uh, record model class, which I haven't created yet, haven't shown you yet, so we'll get there. And just making that a property of the, uh, not property, the field of this class. And that record model is going to be kind of like a repository to interact with Couchbase and save documents. Because we don't want to have, you know, database specific stuff in our controller, right? We want to Keep that separated so keep things testable. Um, I probably should use an IOC controller here, dependency injection sort of thing, but try to keep things simple for demonstration. But you probably want to use that in the real app, otherwise you'll be copying and pasting this same thing over a whole bunch of controllers and we don't want that. So here's an actual endpoint. This is one to save a person to the database. I'm using the route attribute to specify the URL for this endpoint. You don't have to do that. But I like using route endpoints. It makes it very explicit. When I'm looking at this, this action method, I know exactly what URL I should be using. You can use uh, the more traditional routing system to do that. Point. This is going to be a post endpoint. I'm going to post a new person object to this endpoint. And I've created a class here, so I stopped being lazy. I've created a person class here. It's just a POCO that defines some fields that make up a person, so first name, last name, and so on. Asynchronous endpoint, so it returns a task that returns an action result. Again, uh, async not required. I just thought, you know, the node guys are always bragging about how they're asynchronous, so I figured we would show them that we can do the same thing. In this endpoint, I put in some very rudimentary validation. You don't have to do it this way. You can also separate that out to another class or whatever you want to do. But just a demonstration, I'm saying, well, you need to have a first name, a last name, and an email. Otherwise, I'm rejecting that as a bad request. That's a 400 response. And then assuming it passes all that, we'll call the record model save method, pass in the person object to it, and then I'll wrap that in an OK. So that'll return a 200, assuming it uh, goes successfully there. Everybody okay with that so far? Nothing too crazy there? OK. Here's another one. This is just to get a document by the document ID. So I'm using GUIDs in this case. You don't have to use that. You can use whatever else you want to. And this is a, a uh, API git is the route we're going to use. It's a very basic validation. Again, just checking to see that you've actually sent a document ID. And then if you did, well, I'll return the result of the get by document ID method in the record model. Here's a delete endpoint. Hopefully you're starting to see a pattern here. Um, again, it's a post. You can use a delete verb if you wanted to use that instead if, you, if you're down with all the different uh, HTTP verbs. I'm just passing the person in this case, making sure the document was specified. And then if so, call the delete method of record model. 
So it's, it's a good practice to keep your endpoints very, very thin. Make them not do a lot of business logic within the endpoints themselves. Delegate that to a repository or a service or some other sort of code. This is just a traffic cop, basically, what these endpoints are. I said getting the data in, directing it off to a service, and then returning the result. That's all they should be doing. Keep them very, very thin. So let's look at the record model class now. Here's the save method on that class. It's taking in the person object. <coughs> and I'm showing something similar to what we already showed you earlier with creating a new document. Using dynamic here, although I could just as easily use person, but I'll tell you why in a second that I didn't go that route. So this line here contains some of the newer C sharp syntax. So if you're not up to snuff on that, that's totally fine. I'm just going to walk you through it here real quick. We'll look at the data object first. So that's our a person that's being posted here. We're going to see if there's a document ID. If there's a document ID field, I'm going to check to see is that document ID null? This is the new question mark dot operator. So if that's null, then it's going to return null, or it's going to return null for this path of the statement here. If it's not null, it's a string value of it. All right? And then this half here is going to be use the null coalesce operator. All that does is say, is this null on this side? If so, use this side instead. Otherwise, use this side. And so if it's null, it's going to generate a new GUID and write that as a string. So what this means is that if I'm creating a new person or I'm updating an existing person, this code will work for both of them. It's either going to use the existing ID or it's going to generate a new ID. So is everyone following that syntax OK? If it's not, it's totally fine. I can go through it again. I know this is newer syntax. Sometimes I haven't quite, it's hard to keep up sometimes with, with the new stuff they're introducing in C Sharp. I haven't even gotten to the new C Sharp 7 stuff yet. I haven't got a chance to look at that. Stuff yet, so. Yeah, back there. Uh, yeah, I get the, the double uh, question mark. Yeah. Um, pick one or the other, yeah. depending on whether the form is or not. Uh, what's that question mark right after the, the single question mark right after the end? Yeah, so the question is what, what's this uh, question mark dot operator, operator here? So normally you, you could say in, in old C sharp before that you'd say data dot document ID dot two string, right? And that will return you the, the string version of the document ID. But what if this is null? It's going to be a null reference exception. So this just kind of avoids that and says, well, if this is null, then just if the whole thing is null. Otherwise, get the string value. So I don't know. Is, is there a name for that operator? No. Null. Was it? Null. Null co. No, not null co. Sorry? Uh, he said null co. Yeah. Well, the, yeah, the document ID is a nullable type, but I don't know what this operator is called. I, I can't remember. It got introduced to Java a while ago, I think. From, oh, yeah? Uh, it was in Groovy. Uh, it was in Groovy? Groovy, yeah. Okay. I can believe that. I, yeah. The Java language itself, I, I don't know if I believe that. But, uh, yeah, I, I probably should write an alternate version of this that's more wordy, but maybe it would be easier to understand if you're not used to those operators. The next thing I'm doing is I'm saying, okay, content, saying the document value. It's here. called a conditional operator. Con no, like conditional operator? Hopefully it's following the question mark done. Okay. So with content here, what I could do is I could just say content equals data. And that would be done. And save that, that document, save the data, let's serialize the data, something that would be fine. But what I'm doing here is I'm mapping individual value to an anonymous object. And that's it's kind of because I want to demonstrate what's going on here, but also it's kind of safer this way because if someone changes that person class, well then I could end up serializing stuff that I don't want to serialize into the database. Additionally, I also want to add in this, I want to sort of hard code this type equals user field in there. Because what I'm saving here is a document of, it's a user document, right? But our buckets can contain documents of all kinds. So I want to be able to delineate between user documents and other types of documents. This is one way to do that. There's nothing magical about the, the type itself. You could call it foo, you could call it uh, you know, whatever. It's just what I've chosen to, to use to delineate those documents. And then uh, once I have that document, I'm just calling this the bucket again. I'm saying upsert asynchronous. So an asynchronous call. You don't have to use asynchronous, but I'm, I am. Upsert is a combination of update 
and insert. So what it's going to do is if that document already exists by P, it's going to update it, update the value. If it doesn't exist, it's going to insert a new document, hence the insert. That's a pretty common uh, thing in NoSQL databases, and, and Couchbase has it too. So, a lot to take in there. Any questions so far? So, where do you think the documents that you're writing, what is in the different format? It's possible also to create some proper documents like maybe some external format. XML format? Yeah. So, with, uh, so the question is, can I say this is XML format? Well, not exactly. It has an external format, but right? if I want to create some XML into yeah. Yeah. So you want to store something besides maybe you want to store something besides JSON, XML or YAML or something else, right? Um, what I'm showing you right now, you, you can't do that with these operations, but Couchbase can also act as a key value store, which I showed you on a slide earlier, I think. In that case, it doesn't care what the value is. It could be XML, it could be binary, it could be text, whatever you want to store in there. Uh, that's a different approach to NoSQL. Couchbase can do both of those things. Uh, the difference is that if we're using JSON documents and we're storing JSON in Couchbase, we can actually run queries on that and say, well, I want to get all the uh, documents where type equals user, which that would be much more difficult to do if you're just storing values of any sort of arbitrary format. There are some use cases for that. Um, so it is supported, but that's typically that's not what I'm showing you in, in this example tonight. Yeah, I'll head back to Yeah, this may be a more of a stretch question, but is there a possibility in the future where it will be supported? So the question was, is Link supported? Well, well you know, we in the future, yeah, you've heard. Why don't you uh, wait a few slides? Oh, sorry. <laughs> so, yeah, we'll, we'll, see, we'll see some Link today. Yes, oh. definitely. Uh, all right, so uh, once I've run this upsert operation, I'd see something like this, which I kind of showed you already before. This is the key. Just some arbitrary GUID, and this is the JSON object, which is again very simple, but could be more complex if you wanted to. Here is a way to get a document out of the database. So I've chosen to demonstrate nickel or nickel for this case, uh, the get document by ID method. There's actually a an, an operation built into the bucket to get document by their key, and that's a much faster operation than using nickel. But I thought I'd show off some nickel in this example just to just to get you a little bit comfortable with it before I show you some more complex stuff. So uh, this method is taking in the document ID, the, the key of the document, and I'm generating a SQL query here that says, okay, give me these fields, first name, last name, email, from all the documents, from the bucket name, which you don't see here, but it's actually a, a property of the, of the class or a field of the class, aliasing that bucket as users, and then I'm saying, uh, give me some metadata about the documents. One of those things is the key, where the key equals dollar sign one. That's a parameter. That's your passing. Yeah, good question. Is it similar to Mongo and that you can't do joins? So the question was, is it similar to Mongo and that you can't do joins? And the answer is, you can do joins. This is nickel. It's a superset of SQL. So it includes uh, all the goodness you come to expect from SQL. Joins, unions, subqueries. Um, now the joins are can't join one field to another, you can join one field to another key right now. Um, maybe a field to field join is coming later down the line, but right now it's field to uh, key. So you can do joins, yes. Yeah, back then. Uh, that ID, basically, is that the only type? Like, can you custom define what metadata you store? Can you custom define what metadata is stored? And I don't think so. The metadata is like couch based metadata. So if you want to store some other data, you can store it in the document yourself. That's You can define the document however you want to. But you can't actually add fields to metadata. There's some other stuff in there like, um, oh, I don't know, time to live, and uh, CAS, and things like that. But, sorry? What about an e-tag? Is that part of metadata? A what, a what tag? E-tag. E-tag. I'm not familiar with e-tag. In the SQL database, does it uh, common like ID to basically allow for uh, optimistic concurrency? Mm. Uh, there, so it might be called that. It might be called uh, CAS in our system. Um, so, yeah, I don't think it's called. I don't think we have something called ETag, but it might be the same thing, just a different name. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay, uh, so I take this query and then I put, put into query request.create, which is the string in here. Now I have to add a parameter here because you can have SQL injection in a NoSQL database. So make sure to parameterize your arguments. That's what I'm doing here. Send the document ID. Then same query asynchronously and save those to dynamic objects and return the rows from the result there. So this is going to, it's only going to ever select one document here because I'm doing it by ID. But it's going to be a collection of documents assigned one. And again, don't actually do this because there is an operation called bucket top git that does this much faster. I'm just kind of getting the the toe into the pool of, of nickel right now. You're returning the rows shouldn't the task be like a list dynamic or something like You that? could make a list dynamic, but dynamic can also be a list itself. So yeah. And because these are going right to an endpoint, I don't need to do any extra processing on them, so I'm just sort of dumping it out there. Okay. Uh, here's some more new C sharp syntax which you may not be familiar with. But here's a delete method. So this is going to have a document ID. I'm going to say bucket.remove or remove async. And pass in the document, it will remove the document. So if you're not familiar with this, again, I'm not sure what the operator is called, but it's really a shortcut for that. Lambda? Uh, it's, I don't think it's a lambda. It's, um, I can't remember. But it, it basically removes the brackets and you get rid of the return, and then there you go. So it's the same thing as this. Okay, so I'm going to jump. Oh, yeah, go ahead. What type of security is this supposed to Say that again? Security. What kind of security? Yep. So um, there are lots of security options with Couchbase. You can definitely put a password on buckets. Uh, you probably should in production. There's some, um, oh, client, oh, well, it's X, X459 or what? Is, well, I don't know what that is. What's it? 509 certificates. Yeah, yeah. 509 certificates. That's supported too. I'm not. I'm a security expert by far, but there's plenty of security options there, enterprise level security there. Um, we have some encryption as well. I think that's by a, it might be by a third party at this point to encrypt your data in, in Couchbase if you need to do that. So do you have user access? Do you have user level access? Yeah. So yeah, with Couchbase 4 or 5, I believe you have roles available. Um, so you can create, um, I think it's users and roles that can access, you know, they can have write access or, or things like that. What about the backup? And what about backup? Yeah, yeah there, there's the backup. Uh, CB backup is our command line tool to backup databases and restore data. CB restore, restore databases. Is this a single file or is it something? Say that again? Is this a single file? Is, is it a single file? Oh, um, I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, the question was, is it a single file that gets backed up to? And <coughs> probably, probably it is. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly, though. Okay, of course, that's not transaction safe, the backups, right? The backups are not transaction safe. I, I don't know about that. Um, what, if what you're saying is if a backup fails, it probably still reads part of the database? Well, if writes are still occurring to the database while you're doing your backup yeah. because it's not a highly transactional. Right. Oh, order. I see what you're saying. So, yeah, probably it's going to only back it up at a certain point right. when you start the backup. Right. Process. Whereas like SQL Server, you'd, be, you'd have your log file continue to grow while the backup was hmm. going. I'm going to look into the multiple files thing. I actually, I never use the backup and restore utility. I'm kind of new to Couchbase, so I'm going to look into that and find out for you. That'll be a new blog post idea. So thank you. Okay, I'm going to move over to Angular now, unless you guys have more questions. I do like, what's that? I like that. Oh, it is Lambda? Okay, I thought it was called something else. I know there is a Maybe Lambda operator. Like that, so I, had to okay. <laughs> I know there's a Lambda operator, but I don't think. Yeah. I mean, that is a Lambda, but there's probably something additional for saying you can assign a Lambda to a function. Yeah, yeah, I thought something like that. She's yeah. a delegate. Yeah, it's kind of like a delegate. It's 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 basically syntactical sugar is what it is. I mean, it's just changing, swapping that for that. I, I had a quick question. Yeah, uh, I might have missed it if you covered it. The um, when you did the, I think it was the insert or update or upsert. Yeah. Um, you did it as a dynamic instead of using the object that it was coming in as. Yes. Was that just? Like right a, here. 
Yeah, was that just like a separation of models or? Yeah, yeah. Basically, basically I was saying I, I could pass data right into this. That's totally fine. Okay. But my I, my thought was if someone changes that person class, then I might be serializing stuff and saving it to the data that I don't want saving to the data. So I'm just I'm choosing to map them one by one. Okay. And then you mentioned you were talking more about types. So I know you're going to come back to it. But yeah. um, let's say somebody does change that person class, and then you have like, do you end up with mixed types? Do you do a migration? And then how do you handle the deserialization? And I would imagine you're talking about, because you have that type reference, mm -hmm. you could essentially have, you know, a, a reference that's stored with each document to tell you how it can be deserialized. Well, so, so the question is, if I change that person type, and then I deserialize it later, how is that going to, going to work? So right. um, if, if I were to pass in, um, so if I'm pulling it back out, if I were to put person here yep. as the type, it's going to try to map all those fields that it can to what the person type currently is. Right. right? So if there are fields that are not there, they won't get they won't get set, and right. vice versa. Right. right. So it's going to. I mean, this is going to go off of whatever type you put in there as as you're running. Right. So, so you either have to do it to dynamic and then deserialize it yourself, or you have to really know what you're getting. Uh, before you request it, um, as far as the type that you're getting. So, so if you're adding if you're adding more fields to your person object. Yeah, I mean, let's say you're yeah. adding one that's now not nullable. Or I don't know, like if, oh. you know, obviously if it were up to developers, we would only change certain things. But yeah, when it's right. up to the business, it doesn't really work that way. Right. So, I mean, like not nullable, like an integer or something, it's just not going to get set. It's going to remain its default value, okay. which is which is zero for an integer, right? Yeah. So, I mean, that's yeah. Okay. That's, that's cool though, I think that's a good feature because uh, like within any framework, if you had to maybe a repeated property or something like that, yeah. it would blow up, right? And it would try to say, oh, I don't have you know, a good map for this, and it would just explode. So you're saying that this will not, it will basically, it's more tolerant to skipping properties you can't directly map to? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I'm not sure if that's true on every framework, but I, but yeah, I think you're right in that yeah. it's a lot more flexible here. You know, your schema is not as rigid. You know, in any framework, you have to deal with that that mis potential mismatch between your table and your object. Or in this case, you're, you're basically just storing objects, and as they evolve, you know, the old objects will still hypothetically map to the new ones. Right? So there's some more flexibility there, but there's some more uh, rigor you have to now uh, put into your your data design and, and your your code for sure. So you can store anything you want to, but doesn't mean you just go off half cock and store whatever, anything, right? You should have some rigor and some thought about what you're storing and how you're storing it, for sure. So the database isn't forcing the schema on you. You should force the schema on you. But by using the dynamic, you're not really forcing it either. So you're kind of just like throwing it to the side. Yeah, and I, yeah I'm using I'm, I'm dynamic here because I'm super lazy. Uh, it makes for an easier demo for slides, but I probably would never want to use dynamic in uh, a real application. Okay. Well, this way I was curious what, how you felt about it. I didn't know. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Angular. So I know there are some of you in the group who are comfortable with Angular JS, and um, I'm not one of them. I'm not an Angular expert at all. So I'm just going to kind of scratch the surface here of Angular. And if you're not interested in Angular, that's fine. A React or uh, Backbone or whatever else can work just fine, do the same sort of thing. So I'm just going to show you a couple quick examples of, of the source code. You can see the full thing on GitHub. So here is in the Angular app.js file. I'm creating a function here called uh, fetch all. I'm putting it on the on the scope, on the Angular scope there. And that function is just going to make an HTTP get request to this uh, API endpoint get all. I didn't show you that one, but you can imagine what we'll do with get all the person documents. Then here the promise here, JavaScript promise that says if that's successful, then and then pass the result to the function as defined here, and that's just going to loop through and set this items property on scope to the key value pairs. There's the key, there's the value of the document. So then I can take that and apply it to my Angular templates and show, uh, you know, the list of, of persons to to a to a grid or a table there in, in my uh, HTML page. So all this is really doing, all this is connected to the back end is through this API endpoint. It doesn't matter if it's web API or if it's uh, express on node or whatever, it's going to uh, just communicate via that. And uh, if I want to save a document, here is the save method. So in this case, this has a function that I'm passing all the values into that Angular method. Again, probably not optimal. There's probably better ways to do that. 
we're just going to make another HTTP request to the post endpoint here for API save, which I did, which I did show you earlier. I'm going to pass in this to the uh, this data is what's going to be posted there as the body of that uh, request. I'm also going to pass in this document ID, which if we're creating a new person, this document ID will probably be undefined or null. And um, so that will pass a, a null or undefined to the document ID, which is fine because our endpoint can handle that. It can handle it not being there. It'll just create a new document. If it does exist, we'll pass document ID and it'll update the existing document. So this save method works for both inserts and updates. Um, yeah, and state params is the uh, way to get the Angular parameters. So that's the extent of the Angular code I can show you in slides today, but the full example is available out there on GitHub if you guys are interested. Okay, any questions on that? Anybody here using Angular? This is Angular 1, Angular JS. A bunch. Okay, anybody using Angular 2 yet? One? Anybody want to use Angular 2 yet? Oh, okay. Interesting. All right. What about uh, anybody else using anything else like Backbone or uh, Ember or React, anything like that? There's a new one every day, so. <laughs> okay, cool. All right. I want to go back to C Sharp here and show you some more complex nickel queries in C Sharp just to show you that this is this is a serious implementation of SQL. It's not just a sort of you know, SQL looking. It's an actual SQL implementation. So I'm going to switch over to a new bucket called the travel sample. This is building the Couchbase server. When you install it, you can optionally install the travel sample. It's kind of analogous to Northwind, if you're familiar with SQL, which is sort of a sample data set you can play with with lots of sort of real looking data in there. And in this case, I'm doing a, a union. So I have two selects, I'm going to bring them together, and what I'm getting here is uh, all the routes uh, that go from an airport or to an airport. So I'm selecting the, I guess the airport code, the geolocation, which is an embedded um, object with latitude, longitude, and elevation. From the buckets, aliasing that as R, I'm not sure why aliasing that as R, and then where airport name equals you know, the from or the to that I passed in. Those are the positional parameters there. It's again, by, it's again um, asynchronous, so it's going to wait on that query. And if I did that, the result would look like this. This is a screenshot of the query workbench in the Couchbase console admin. So here's the result. You can see there's um, Columbus, and here's the geolocation. It's a complex object. It's not just you know, three fields, but it's a one field with three fields in it as a sub-object. And uh, down here is, excuse me, is the Dayton Wright Brothers uh, Airport. So I meant to update it to be O'Hare, but uh, oh well. Uh, and then here, if you click on the table tab, you can see sort of a table view of that JSON data. So maybe it's a little easier to picture what's going on here. Well, we've got two fields, and one of those fields is just a string, and one of those fields is actually an object that itself has three fields. So it's uh, sort of like an embedded table, kind of. All right, now here's a more complicated example. And uh, I'm gonna go through this um, a little slower, so don't panic if it looks really complicated here. But this shows you sort of the additional stuff we put into Nickel. Because we're dealing with JSON and not tabular rows, we need some additional functionality. That's what makes it a superset. So in this case, I've created a method called find all routes on day. So I want to find all the routes from airports A to airport B on a specific day of the week, like Sunday. Yeah, go ahead. I'm familiar with the unnest. What does that do? Yes, that is, unnest is a, is a syntax we've added to SQL to help deal with, with JSON. I'm definitely going to cover that, for sure. Um, so, what, so, uh, so what I'm doing is, you can see here I'm selecting some fields here. From uh, you can see the aliases are R, A, S. Those are all covered there. So the first one is travel sample bucket. I'm aliasing it as R. So I'm selecting routes. I'm going to unnest a field from those documents, which is the schedule. And the schedule is an array of all the flights that happen from in that route. You know, so if you have a route of San Francisco to Miami, there could be 10 flights that take that route. 
I'm going to do a join to this to the sample bucket, and my route has a field called airline ID, which is a key to another document. So I'm going to join documents together based on that key. I'm going to reply to some standard where's and order it by name. So don't panic if uh, that looks too complicated. I'm going to go through here slowly and interactively in the query uh, workbench. The, uh, so the unmasked, it, it takes this, it looks at the schedule field, which is an array, and it puts it into this task. So it kind of treats it as, it's kind of a, a join, but to itself, to its own document. And so from S, I can get the flight and the time. And don't worry, well, hopefully this will be clear when I explain it uh, sort of interactively here. So let's go over here to the query tab. And this is kind of a way for you to, you know, design Nickel queries and execute them and see what happens. So I've got some examples here. Just walk you through it. So let's start with something relatively simple looking. You guys see that okay? So I'm just, this is a much more simple select. It's saying give me those fields from every document in the travel sample bucket, which I'm aliasing as R. And I only want documents where the source airport equals San Francisco and the destination airport equals Miami. I'm going to go ahead and execute that, and this is the results. So I should have, let's see, I have three results here. I screwed up. There we go. So the first result is this airline, 439. I don't know what airline that is, but that's, a, that's kind of like a foreign key. It's a key to another document somewhere in my bucket. Here's some information about the airport or the route. And then here's the schedule field. The schedule field is an array of schedule objects. So if I look at the JSON view, you can see that here's my basic fields and here's the schedule field, which is an array. Day flight time, day flight time over and over. So I have three sets of that. So there's another one with a different airline and another one with a different airline. So I've got all that data there. So that tells me all the, the routes from San Francisco to Miami. All right? So that might be useful. That's, that's a good set of data. Maybe I can work with that. But let's say I want to do, I want to flatten out a little bit. Oh no, hang on. Let's do this first. So instead of saying airline 439, I actually want to get the name of the airline. That's stored in a separate document. So I need to join to that document to get it. So let's add the join in here. So I'm joining this R alias to another alias. It's in the same bucket, but I'm calling it A for airline. And I'm joining it on the keys that are in R airline ID. So this key right here will join to another document and combine it into the result. So execute that. And now instead of the airline ID, I have American Airlines. So I'm selecting A.name from that. Notice now I only have a result of two. I think there might be a missing airline in this sample. So maybe that's on purpose. I don't know. Uh, but there's only two because this is a, a this is just a join. If I wanted to do them all, I'd do a left join. Now I have result count of three. But notice there's no name here because it's it's null because that airport doesn't exist. All right. So left join, joins, they're all in there. So two results. Okay, with me so far? Joins in NoSQL? SQL in NoSQL? Pretty wild stuff. Okay, now let's look at unmasked. So I have this schedule field here. It's an array, sort of a, a subtable, right? Now suppose I want to flatten this out and join my parent document <coughs> to each row of that subtable or that, that sub document. So I'm going to say unmasked r.schedule and alias that is s. This is kind of like a join, but it's 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 there because JSON has arrays, so we need some additional syntax to deal with that. Execute that. Now instead of two results, I have 52 results. Because so I've done a join amongst those, those subarrays. So most of the data in these rows is identical except for the flight is different, because that's different per flight, and the time is different, it's different per flight. There's some for American Airlines, and there's some for U.S. Airways. Right, so it's, it's kind of another type of join, but it's really unique to the JSON data type. 
This really wouldn't make sense in a relational model, a pure relational model. Yeah, go ahead. Does the database maintain a data type? Does the database maintain a data type? Yeah. So, um, what do you mean by data type? Uh, like, um, in condition, how it differentiates whether it's a string comparison I'm sorry, I'm trouble hearing you. So, in rare condition? Yeah. How it understands whether it's a string comparison or it's an integer comparison? Oh, I see. Oh, yes. So, uh, the, f the fields in JSON, they have, they have a type, just like JSON has a type. So your field may be a string, a number, um, what else is in JSON? String number, Boolean, Boolean uh, well, array, another object, of course, and there's one more. Date calendar? Date, well, there is no official date in JSON, but there is some date methods in, in Nickel to deal with that. Uh, so yeah, there, there are types, just like JSON has types, this is just using JSON. So how do you specify the type? How do you specify the type? Uh, well, just like you do in JSON, you use it's literally a string with, with quotes, or it's an integer, uh, just with numbers. I mean, it's just how you'd expect it. So if I looked at, uh, well, I don't know. If you look here at the JSON, you can see that this is a string because it's in quotes. This is an integer because it's just got a literal integer there. And if I went, well, you saw the, er, the example earlier with arrays, same sort of thing there. So if you like JSON, this is, this is just regular JSON. If you don't like JSON, well, sorry, JSON. Okay, uh, and let's uh, finish up the example here. I'm going to say, I just want all the, all the flights on day zero, which I guess in the travel world is Sunday. Yeah, go ahead. Quick question. Sure. This reminds me of, uh, the other thing reminds me of uh, something that Access came up with later on where they would have uh, a drop-down object that was impossible to work with, I thought. But, uh, I'm sorry, I blacked out if you said Access. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> uh, but would you use that on Nest to populate a drop-down box and then do the, uh, the two-table kind of, uh, what you call it, where, where you look up an item in it? Pulls up the whole is table. Cross tab is that the view? Like cross tab um, is that? Yeah, that would have been called. I don't think it's quite the same thing. I don't know if I'd use that for a drop down. Um, the the unnest anyway. I mean, I, I guess you could. I don't. I don't see it's why essentially you could. turning columns into rows is what it's doing, right? Yeah, in a way. Yeah, yeah. basically. Pivot. I was going to say pivot. Pivot. Uh, it's not quite the same. Yeah, no, it's not really the same thing as pivot, but I mean, it's we're in the neighborhood, right? Still kind of scares me in that way. <laughs> oh, okay. Well. <laughs> I, I think I mean I think it's pretty neat in the fact that uh, you know your nested arrays and everything on this. Can I ask though your your execution time obviously dramatically increased, right? Like tenfold or so. Um, can you talk a little bit about indexes? Yeah. So you're talking about okay. the execution time here. Indexing so, is definitely a feature that. You, very important to CouchBase, even more so than relational, because you have buckets that have a whole bunch of documents in them. You know, you're, you're indexing the bucket, not just individual tables. Right? Um, don't go off the execution time on my machine. This is running on my developer machine. I've got limited resources designated to it. Um, so don't go off that time as a, as a benchmark. Uh, and um, But uh, yeah, indexing is important. The travel sample, in fact, comes with some indexes built in. These are going to make a huge difference in your uh, query time. So um, I've got some indexes here. So that, for instance, type. If I said where type equals who, it's going to use that index, right? If that index wasn't there, uh, it's either not going to run because there's no index it can use. Or I'm going to have a more generic index like this one up here, primary. If I hit the primary type index, it's basically a table scan. So it's going to be pretty slow. So have to go through each of those figure out um, how to run that query. So indexing is very important thing to do. I don't have time to go into it today, um, unfortunately, but very rich indexing library. There's like seven different types of indexes in Couchbase. If you go to the Couchbase forums, people are asking about indexing all the time. One thing that might help, if you use the keyword explain here, execute that, it'll give you some information about what indexes it's using, uh, which ones it found, and things like that, which is great for debugging your indexing and figuring out, oh, did I do this indexing right or not? So, yeah, go ahead. Are the indexes set up the same way they are in SQL? 
on the index is set the same way we are in SQL. Um, kind of. So, I mean, for instance, I could just say create, create uh, index, print, create primary index? Yeah. Primary index on you know, my bucket name, for instance. And then I could go on, I don't know the exact syntax, but I could say a field one, field two. Because this is JSON, I need some additional dotted syntax, so I can say like field three dot child dot grandchild, etc. Or if it's an array, I could say grandchild uh, zero. So all that dotted notation, all the array notation is part of nickel now, because you need that to access those those extra fields. So indexing is, is very important. Definitely check, definitely get into that as you're getting into nickel. All right, uh, I cleared all my history. But, oh yeah, I'm doing this. So I added uh, and day equals zero. So apparently in the travel industry, Sunday equals day zero. So execute that. And now I have uh, nine results. So these are all the flights on Sunday from uh, San Francisco to Miami. So that would be a pretty helpful thing to have in my travel application. So if anybody, anybody here familiar with Cassandra, they have a thing called CQL, which is Cassandra query language. It looks a lot like SQL, but it doesn't nearly have as many features as this. There's no joins, there's no one nesting, things like that. Um, so this is a real full implementation of, of SQL, and it's improving with every release. OK, let's go back over to the slides, I think. Just if you want to see those pictures again, that's why. I'm on to you, PowerPoint. Oh boy. Angular, complex. Yep, we did that, we did that. On nest. Okay. Here is where you can find the full source code for the Angular app that I showed you today. Uh, Couchbase Labs on GitHub. There's lots of other cool stuff out there if you're interested in languages besides .NET or besides Angular. Go and check that out. A whole bunch of stuff there. Couchbase is all open source too. They're all on GitHub under github.com slash couchbase. So you can check all that stuff out there too. And if you're interested in Nickel, learning more about that, we have an online interactive Nickel tutorial that you can follow along the instructions or write your own Nickel queries. And uh, it's, it's kind of like a sandbox environment, so you can enter whatever Nickel you want to. You don't have to install Couchbase or anything. I think there may be a couple things disabled for security reasons. Otherwise, it's a full nickel experience right there in your browser. So that's that's pretty cool. Um, that I really like that when I started that Couchbase. Okay, now to the part that someone in the back was waiting for, Link. Now there's this uh, open source tool called Link to Couchbase. It's not officially supported by Couchbase yet, but it is worked on by Couchbase employees, and it may become official at some point. Now, we don't have ORMs in Couchbase because we don't have, you know, it's not, there's no impedance mismatch. What we do have is called ODM, it's object, uh, object Data Mappers. Um, so you don't have to use Link to Couchbase, but if you don't want to write your own nickel or you want to do some other cool stuff with, you know, just writing C-sharp code, you can use Link to Couchbase. So, to start with Link to Couchbase, you might want to create a POCO class like Airline here. And then you can put some attributes on it. I put a document type builder with an airline string on there. Optional. You'll see why in a minute that's optional. And then, unfortunately, the travel sample was created by those Java script guys. So they paste their stuff differently than C sharp guys. So I'm saying, okay, name means name. Right? Uh, type means type. Uh, and then I'm ignoring this ID because that's why I want the key to go. That's not, I want to store that in the document itself. It's just going to be the key. All right. So then once I have this in place, this airline class, I can then write something like this with link to Couchbase. I can say, uh, well, DB would be bucket, actually. I should change that to bucket. I'll do it right now. I keep saying that. Every time I present this, I never change it. Bear with me here, I'm doing some quick editing. Bucket, 
there we go. And we're going to go back to page one. No. Okay, so now I can say bucket.query. It gives me all the airline documents in my bucket, and then I want to select the name from them. So I would, this would give me American Airlines, uh, US Air, United, and so on. Okay. Now, I said earlier that this document type filter is optional. If I didn't put that on there, I'd have to add this line in and say, give me the documents where type equals airline. Otherwise, it'll try to map every single document in the bucket to an airline object, uh, which is not what you want, I don't think, because you don't want a route map to an airline. It doesn't make any sense. So if you, if you put that attribute up there, it'll automatically sort of add that type equals to the where clause when it generates your nickel query. I'm showing you the, uh, the link syntax. I don't really like the link syntax. You can use the normal extension method syntax too. That's, that's up to you. This is a very good link implementation. I'm not going to go into too much detail because it's, it's again, not officially supported, but it's a, it's a great open source project. Check it out. It's on GitHub as well. Okay, so that is all the Couchbase server content I have for now. You guys have more questions? You can ask them now or you can ask them if you think of it later. You can ask that as well. How are we doing on time? Because I've got some mobile content I can show you if you're interested as well. Are we good on time? Okay. Maybe 15 minutes of mobile content. If you guys are interested in mobile, anybody into Xamarin in here, anything like that? Someone over here maybe in this area? Okay, so now for something completely different. We're talking about Couchbase Mobile. Couchbase Mobile is sort of the umbrella term to cover all these parts. We have Couchbase Lite, which can live on your mobile device, your phone, your tablet, your IoT device, whatever. It's an embedded NoSQL database. You can kind of think of it as a replacement for SQLite, the mobile device. So that can be used just on its own, uh, by itself as an offline you know, access locally database. Optionally, you can hook that up to Sync Gateway. What Sync Gateway will do is it will talk, but your data is will talk to Sync Gateway and sync data between that device and all the other devices that are hooked up to that Sync Gateway. So if I have, and I'll, sh I'll show you a demo of this, but if I had two apps, two, a to-do list app, and I put things on the list here, they'll get synced and show up on my other device over here. Just uh, automatically in the background, you don't have to do any extra well, some extra, but not much extra work to sync up those databases between each other. And then finally, you can hook up Sync Gateway to Couchbase Server to persist that data. Otherwise, Sync Gateway is just going to store it in RAM, and it's going to, if it goes down, it's, you're going to lose that data. So you want to back it up to a uh, Couchbase Server cluster. All right. All three of these parts are open source, just like uh, Couchbase Server is, and all available on GitHub. Couchbase Lite. So it's kind of a replacement for NoSQL. It's stored on the device, so it's always available. It doesn't require you to be online to use it. And it can be used on the desktop if you want to. If you're writing a, a Windows Form app or a Mac OS X app, you can use it on those. But typically, we see it on, on Android and uh, iOS type of apps. So Unity, Xamarin, Quillen Gap. I'm not sure how many of those are officially supported. I know at least Android and iOS are. I don't know about Xamarin or uh, Unity or, or phone yet. But it, there are uh, SDKs available for those. Xamarin is supported. Sorry? Xamarin is supported. Officially supported? Yeah. Okay, great. I'm not, the, I'm not the mobile advocate, by the way. I'm more of the server advocate. So um, if you have a really tough mobile question, I might point you to the guy who is the uh, mobile advocate. Uh, so the other thing that this does, kind of interesting, I want to point out is it kind of it fires up its own sort of mini web server. That's, that's when you're using Couchbase Lite, there's a mini web server there. So hypothetically, you could have devices communicate to each other and do some sort of peer-to-peer -peer network. I don't think anyone's done that yet. I don't know if that's officially supported, but it's kind of an interesting little tidbit there. Same gateway synchronizes data to and from, or to or from, Couchbase Lite, and you can sync it to Couchbase Server. The, the sync doesn't need to know about the devices. The device will just connect to, to sync. So it's like middleware. It's, uh, it's written in Go. It's deployed to a separate cluster from Couchbase Server, so it's not uh, integrated with Couchbase Server directly. And you can use uh, Facebook authentication 
or a persona or even your own authentication to manage access to a sync gateway. In Couchbase Server, which I've talked about uh, a lot so far, but that's where you could hook up the other end of the Couchbase sync table. Okay. Couchbase Lite. Um, yeah, I already said it has its own little web server. Uh, the footprint is around 400k, so it's a pretty small addition to your apps. It runs in process. And uh, yeah, so we, it's a NoSQL database. You have the MapReduce functionality. We have some eventing and, and synchronization. So here's a little snippet of some Xamarin. Uh, I chose Xamarin because it's a .NET group. Um, you can also use uh, Telerik native script or iOS or whatever. So I'm just saying right up here, give me uh, a database called mgrowth-database. If that doesn't exist, it'll create it. If it does exist, it'll give me a reference to it. And then I say, OK, now I have a database, create a document. The database. Create doc. Then I say, okay, on that document, put some properties on there. And I'm passing in a dictionary and that's going to use to serialize the JSON. And uh, there we go. That's all, all you have to do to save a document to Couchbase Lite on your, on your mobile device. You can uh, this, this will automatically generate a key for you. You can also specify the key if you want to. You have a, a reference of how keys are, are created. MapReduce, it's similar to what we show, show, saw earlier with Couchbase. One of the things, though, is you can build these indexes with your native language. So if you're using Xamarin, you can build them MapReduce with C Sharp. This is very cool because you can set breakpoints in them to debug through them, which is very nice. And the results get persisted, so we have uh, speed, up, speed up the queries with that. MapReduce is just a function in this case. So here's an example. I want to create a view called people, so get the view. And then I say set the map. And that's going to expect a lambda that contains a document. It's going to loop through each document back to this function. And then the mid function that you want to call to emit the actual key value pair. So what I'm doing here is I'm saying, well, if that document contains a key called Twitter, then emit that document key value pair. If I don't have a value called Twitter, then I'm not going to emit that. So what this means is that if you don't have a Twitter account, you're not a person. Which is true to really. Uh, but that, anyway, that's just a view to query, uh, you know, to query your documents in Couchbase Lite. And then to actually execute that, I say get the existing view of people, create that query and run it, and I can loop through the rows and display them wherever I want to do. There are asynchronous options as well, and there's also a live query option to do some stuff with observables, which we'll see uh, in action here when I get to the demo. So you don't have to keep pulling it, it'll just, uh, you know, We've got your observable pattern. Change notification, so we can listen for changes back to the database. So we don't have to keep pulling it and saying, well, is this in there yet? Is this in there yet? Is this gone yet? That sort of thing. You can just listen for a change instead. You can listen for changes in the data, in the queries, and even the documents. And uh, so here's an example of that. Once we have the database, we can hook up an event to db.change. So this will happen when any change in the database occurs. This event will fire. And it looks like, you know, your standard C-sharp event um, pattern here. Database change event args has some information about the changes. So I can look through the db.changes. It's going to be a collection. It's going to get batched up. So you're not doing just one at a time here. I'll look through those changes. And then I can see, well, what kind of change was it? Was it a conflict? Was it a delete? You know, what, what, what is this change about? And then I can respond to that change. I can, for instance, if there's conflict, I can log the document ID. Or, you know, prompt the user and say, hey, there's a conflict, what should I do about it? That sort of thing. All right. Uh, synchronization. You get a full multi-master replication. That just means that each uh, Couchbase Lite that's connected to the sync gateway is going to be a copy of the full database gets persisted out to the mobile devices. So when you're online, it'll synchronize and get all the data that you know has been updated since you've been offline, and vice versa. You have some options when it comes to battery drain, because you know, if you're pulling a lot, that sync gateway can really drain the battery. And sync gateway has some ways to handle conflict detection. So this, uh, someone earlier mentioned conflicts. With Couchbase Mobile, 
it is more like the, you, know, you can have a split brain, right? Because each mobile device can go offline at some point, right? That's a, that's a common scenario. So we need to be able to handle that conflict. So here's how you would hook up your Couchbase Lights database to Sync Gateway. You can do a push and a pull, or you can do one or, or both. And you just give it the address of the Sync Gateway. And this is how you can control your battery usage. You can continuously uh, do your push and pull. That's going to use more battery than, than not doing it continuously. And then you just pick them off and start it. But that's it. Once you do that, all you're doing now is you keep doing the same thing you were with your Couchbase Light database. You're reading to it and writing from it. And then in the background, it's going to be syncing that to and from Sync Gateway. So the rest of your operations don't change at all. It's just once you fire off Sync Gateway, it's, it's doing that work. All right, this slide here. Oh my goodness, look at all this. It's amazing. This is how you can get Couchbase Light. I think these are some Java things that are good. I don't, I don't know. Someone told a joke earlier. What is, what, uh, why do Java programmers use Java? Something like that. Why do programmers use Java? Or glasses. Because they can't see sharp. Or glasses. Like that. <laughs> oh, why do they wear glasses? Yeah. I got, I messed up the joke. Anyway, uh, NuGet is where you get Couchbase Lite. It's also open source on GitHub. Uh, NPM. Gateway config JSON, so it's going to start running that sync gateway server. Port there. Now, this next part, sometimes I see a crash. I don't know why yet. I'm going to log into sync gateway. You can see there's some noise happening in the background because sync gateway is doing something. Sometimes when I hit add list, it decides to crash. Anything doing this time? Okay. So far, so good. I'm lucky. All right, so uh, let's add a new to-do list on this app over here. Wedding planning. All right. Create the list on that side, and it syncs over to this side automatically. So then, this is the bride's phone, so she says, oh, I need to uh, buy a dress. And then if I go over here, you can see that buy a dress shows up on my list. And the groom says, oh, I need to, I don't know, uh, pick a venue. Which, really, there's nothing on the, the groom's list, right? It's all the bride, bride's choice. Back me up, fellas, am I right? Yeah. Okay, it, it crashed that time. Log in, okay, and... Okay, this one's probably gonna crash now, too. I'm sure of it. Uh, but you can see that it's syncing the data between them. Uh, so, uh, Cake. It's going to show up over there. So, all I'm doing is writing the databases locally and they can sync up to the sync database. Yeah, go ahead. Um, this isn't using sockets, right? These are actually listening changes and doing post or actual issues. Can you call it individually? Um, the question is is it using sockets or is it doing HTTP calls individually? I don't know that's what it is. It looked like when you did something, it showed the background of HTTP. Post gets. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, it's it's um. So I, I, there's actually if you bring up the browser, there's actually I don't know if I want to do this or not. Going off too off script here. Not an area of expertise, but um. So the application itself, my my code is not doing those posts and gets. 
it's, uh, it's the Couchbase Lite. Since I hooked up to the same gateway, it's doing that behind the scenes. So I'm writing to the database. Since it's doing continuous, it's going to then behind the scenes go talk to the sync gateway for me. So I'm not, I'm not setting up specific endpoints on sync gateway myself. That's all happening in the back. So, so the client, client can be socketed by the server's passing on response to those, those events. I, I don't know the details of whether it uses sockets or not. It yeah. very well could. I'm not, I'm not sure exactly. That'd be a good thing for me to know. Was there another question? I thought it was a little bit more. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I have a question about the server side. Uh, yeah. I've been using Mongo like for two and a half years. And okay. um, one thing I didn't hear is like, what's why use uh, Couchbase versus Mongo? I mean, I saw the, <laughs> the, the joins yeah. in Lumion, and that comes with the question, does this mean there's a performance lag versus Mongo when you have you know, for that feature? Calculus. So the question. So two questions. Like one okay. of them is uh, since we have joins and answers, I would assume there is a performance trade if you open this feature for the document based uh, database. And uh, why would they use Couchbase versus Mongo? Okay. So the why would I use Couchbase versus Mongo question? I. That's a really broad question. I, I don't think I can give you an answer in a short period of time. Um, and I'm absolutely not here to say you should use one over the other. I, I, I wish you guys would try Couchbase, but also it's up to you whether you want to use Mongo or Couchbase or React or whatever yeah, else. You like, there should be like a feature. It's like, it should be like, I mean, XYZ feature that yeah. Couchbase would better in performance, would better in something. I mean, yeah. I, yeah, I, I mean, I don't, I don't want this to devolve in some sort of like trash talk session. There's, there's plenty of uh, blog posts on our site if you're interested in seeing a deep comparison of Mongo um, and things like that. I, you know, I just want you to try Couchbase, and if you like Mongo better, that's fine. That's totally cool. Uh, as far as performance hit with Nickel, you know, I think compared to a standard Git by document, you know, Git document by key operation, it's going to be faster to do that than it is to run Nickel query. Like I showed you earlier that example where I'm selecting a document by ID with Nickel. I wouldn't do that instead of the standard Git operation. Um, but as far as performance goes, you know, Nickel queries I think are, are, you know, as long as your indexing is 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 sound, Nickel query is going to be pretty fast. Uh, and additionally, writing Nickel, writing SQL to me is more intuitive than you know, going through a whole MapReduce thing and, and trying to map all these objects together. You know, it, it, it's easier to do a join that way. It's easier to do unioning, things like that, than how through about using SQL. Sorry? Bucket referencing. Bucket differencing? Reference. Referencing. Yes. So can I reference like a, a bucket from other bucket? Like in a nickel query? Yes. Yes, you can select from multiple buckets in nickel query. Yes. No, no, no. I mean, Assuming I had airplane, and for some reason I needed to split uh, a document key from two buckets. Like I have an airplane and I have an airport. Uh -huh. And for some reason they both have to be different buckets. Yeah. Uh, can airport reference an object for uh, uh, air, uh, airport reference an object for airplane and vice versa? Yes. And yes. Does that done under the hood or do I have to? No. Uh, no. The, if I had two buckets here, I could. Just select them as if they're two different tables. Um, so up here I could say select a dot foo and b dot bar from uh, bucket one a, and then join bucket b on keys you know uh, a dot whatever id that sort of thing. So I could join across buckets like that. Yes, absolutely. Can I specify a referential uh, constraint to Hewlett Packard? Can you specify a referential constraint? No. There's nothing like that built into Couchbase server itself. So that would be really on you to say, uh, well, let me think about that. There might actually be an index. Yeah. Like a, like a, um, I think there might be some indexing to say, oh, it has to be unique. That sort of thing. So you could have that sort of constraint on a field. But it, but as far as like a foreign key constraint, I don't I don't think that would be possible with Calculus, at least not yet. Okay. 
Sorry? So you're talking about transactions? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, with transactions, there are each document write is atomic. So when you're writing to a document, that's completely atomic. Uh, multiple documents, uh, you can't do a transaction with Couchbase, at least not yet. Uh, that would put uh, a lot of performance constraints on the system because you have to potentially lock different nodes, and that would be very difficult to do. So uh, there are some patterns you can use to implement transactions, uh, like double check locking and things like that, but it's going to take more work for you to implement that transaction. So yeah. if, you, if you need lots of transactions in your data, uh, you know, like I said, Individual documents are atomic, right? So if I don't need to necessarily represent a concept in two different tables now, when they can live in one single document. So I don't necessarily need to worry about did it succeed to this table and this table. Well, I've combined them into one document now, so I don't need to worry about that. But if you really do need transactional, uh, you know, transactions in your database, even with a NoSQL database design, there are no transactions in Couchbase. Uh, I don't think I don't think many of them do have transactions. For that matter, there are some that, that do. I think um, once they like Foundation DB has uh, transactions, it's asset compliant, for instance. Okay. Okay. So uh, did the mobile sample? Let's go back to my slides. Okay. And here is the Xamarin code for that uh, app I showed you. To do light Xamarin forms. There's other examples out there for Android, for iOS, for native script, and so on. All kinds of stuff on Couchbase Labs. These are what the stickers will look like if I remember to bring them. Uh, if you really want one, if one of these looks really cool, let me know. I'll, I'll get a mail to you. We'll figure it out. If you're really interested to a very deep dive into Couchbase, we have a Couchbase Day coming up in Schaumburg on September 22nd. It's uh, totally free. You can sign up here. Uh, if you need long URLs, I have a short one here for you. CB Day Chicago, um, which might be easier for you to write down. It's a full day event, pre registration, workshops, presentations on Couchbase Server. Um, it's, uh, it, the details are there. I think it's at, oh, uh, shoot, Hyatt, I think. Oh, yeah, right there. Hyatt Place. Yeah, I played Chicago Trombley. I don't know Chicago, so I assume you guys know what that means. Or you can figure it out Google Maps. And then if you're interested in contacting me or my best of my developer advocate team, you can check out our developer portal, our blog. Uh, you can uh, ping me on, on Twitter. We also have a great forum, especially if you have really deep nickel questions. It's a great place to, to ask. Stack Overflow, we also monitor that as well. Oh, that's all I got. So I got, I don't know how much time I have left, but I'm, I'm going to stick around as long as it takes to answer you guys' questions. And other than that, I've got to have a good evening. All right. Thanks, Matt. Now it's time for, oh no. Um, it's time for the raffle. If you guys, is anyone not signed in that wants to be included? If you haven't.